What is happening, all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Nearman Condition. And today I get to talk about the very first Marvel crossover event, or what a lot of us consider the very first Marvel event. So join me for my overview of the Secret Wars Omnibus. Before getting started, I want to give a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the fine folks at Marvel for sending us an advanced copy of this omnibus. This omnibus is due out in the direct market and book market on January 10th or 11th, depending on where you get your books. So what we're looking at here is the standard edition cover by Mike Zek. And what they're using for the direct market cover is the Alex Ross cover here to the left. This is my original printing, by the way. Uh, but I think that file for the dust jacket is still the same. So original printing here and then the new printing over there. But this is going to be the direct market cover, which is, of course, a take on the classic issue number one cover. Of course, the, the of course, the spines will be a little bit different. This Secret Wars right here will be that logo right there. The Marvel Omnibus will be the new Marvel Omnibus logo. And I'm sure that image will still be there. That they're using for the direct market and yes this one's a little bit thicker this book was printed over 10 years ago and here is the back of the book looking very similar using different fonts back here uh, and then telling you what it collects down there the covers of the issues collected in here one very important thing to note is the price the original printing was $99.99 the new printing is $75. So if you missed out on it, it's a good time to get it. Now let's look at it underneath the dust jacket because this original printing has the old, what I like to call kind of Marvel Masterworks look to it. And the new printing has images on it. This is a pretty cool design all over the book. But this is what the old school ones look like. No art on board, but this faux leather and yeah that uh marvel masterworks look to it but let's shift the focus back to this because this is what it looks like underneath the dust jacket no matter which cover you get so i like that it has a very uh poppy artsy feel to it uh, not because they're using the covers but because they're using different colors instead of the traditional colors that they've used for the covers so it's not like they just put a bunch of covers on here. Actually switched it up a little bit with the color scheme. All right, we're going to be opening this up. However, when talking about this era, because this is Marvel's very first crossover. Yes, I realize Contest of Champions or Avengers Defenders, some people regard it. But I mean, to talk about a first big event, this is the one that starts it for a lot of people. And I have to talk about the status quo or some of these characters and what makes it such a big deal. So there might be some minor spoilers as to what came before this. And of course talking about some very important things that happened here. Not going into detail as to how they happen. Uh, yes, I did point at Spider-Man's new costume. Alright, so let's go ahead and talk about this book. So cracking this book open. We have some white end paper. And I'll be doing a comparison uh, internally here in a little bit uh, here is what it collects Jim Shooter Mike Zek I remember Bob Layton actually drawing a couple of issues yeah right there uh, issues four and five and then some of the other artists some of the other writers inkers John Beatty of course inking the entirety but he does get some help here and then the colorist and letters uh, table of contents right here where you're gonna find each page including the introduction by Tom DeFalco, all the way in 1992, I believe that's probably from the uh, first trade paperback, and then the prologue. So let, let's talk about this book, what it collects first. So this does collect the entirety of Secret Wars, the original Secret Wars, not to be confused with the 2015 Jonathan Hickman Secret Wars, and this collects all 12 issues of that, Thor 383, She-Hulk number 10, and I'm glad they included that, and I'll talk a little bit about why here in a second. What if number 4 and 114? This book has 496 pages. So this has only had one printing, and this is the latest printing. So what's going on here? Why are we getting some pages from some random comics? All right. 
So the year is 1984, and Marvel decided to... Actually, Tom DeFalco does an amazing job explaining the behind-the-scenes. Instead of calling it the Distinguished Competition, he calls DC the Dreaded Competition. <laughs> so both of them were in battle, not just for comic sales, but also merchandising, merchandising, space balls, the toy, anyway, sorry. Uh, they were both trying to get a deal with a toy company. Now, a certain toy company went after DC, they passed over Marvel, I love the way that he words it, by the way. And then Mattel approached Marvel. However, in approaching Marvel, this, keep in mind, this is the 80s, do a lot of us call the golden age of toys, because everything was toys. TV shows, mainly cartoons, were made as a huge toy commercial. So the toys were really driving the market uh, in the same way that they made a deal with Transformers and, and Marvel Comics, because there wasn't a cartoon back then. They approached Marvel about making toys. However, they wanted a story to go along with it. So Jim Shooter decided to take it up, because he was editor-in-chief at the time, and decided that he would write this story uh, about bringing these characters together. Because, like I mentioned, we've had Contests of Champions, and then we had Avengers Defenders War, but that was where... It didn't feel like a huge impact, and that's why most of us consider this to be the real, true first Marvel event. And nothing was ever the same after this, because after this came Secret Wars 2, and then we ended up getting crossover after crossover, whether it was through the annuals, or whether it was through the main titles, or sometimes just the X-Men titles had a crossover, or Spider-Man crossovers. But because of this event, nothing was ever the same. So the story is pretty simple. The heroes all find this big building that just kind of appeared out of nowhere, and a lot of them go in and, and investigate. Now, not every member of the team, for example, this is the team of X-Men that are going to be involved. This is the Avengers at the time, including Monica Rambeau, who is going as Captain Marvel. And you also have the Hulk and Iron Man. Now, the very important thing is that during this time... Jim Rhodes was filling in as Iron Man, but this is Tony Stark walking in. Again, like I said, minor spoilers. Uh, you have the Hulk walking in there and the Fantastic Four without Sue because, well, she was a little preoccupied and Reed was like, hey, you need to lay back off of these adventures because, you know, but if you haven't read it, I'll talk about it during my Fantastic Four by John Byrne on this volume two. I did talk about the importance of this book too because the other thing that they did that was unheard of was... Yes, this was going to be a 12-issue maxi-series. However, they wanted the writers. So the editors, Jim Shooter, everybody got together and, and decided that the writers could go ahead and bring the characters back because you're not going to keep Wolverine and Professor X and Cyclops and Storm and Colossus away from the X-Men for a year. So in one month, they could bring the characters back and say, these are the ramifications of what happened in Secret Wars. So, for example, Spider-Man getting a new costume first showed up in Amazing Spider-Man 252. How he got the costume, you had to have read Secret Wars or continue reading it. Uh, we know that there was a change in the Fantastic Four. The team was missing a member. And how that all happened, happened in the pages here. Now, some of them like the Fantastic Four, and Spider-Man had some big changes. Some of them had minor changes that affected the characters, one of them being Colossus and Kitty Pride. Kitty Pride stayed on Earth while Colossus went to what is called Battle World. So let's focus back on this. But that was a little behind the scenes that I like to tell people about in case they weren't familiar with the story and how it kind of came to be. So they are all summoned here, and these are all the heroes that play a big part in this. You have, like I mentioned, Captain Marvel, Monica Rambeau, Captain America, Storm, Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic, the Wasp. Cyclops, Professor X, Hulk, Thor, Wolverine, The Thing, Spider-Man, Rogue, Iron Man, again, Tony Stark, not James Rhodes, The Human Torch, and She-Hulk, Lockheed even makes an appearance, Hawkeye, Colossus, and Nightcrawler, and of course, Spider-Man, but what the heck is this? Who's this guy? That is Magneto. Why is he with the good guys? What's going on here? That a lot has to do with the toy industry and pushing... Or Magneto to be a hero. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes stories about that and why some people speculated, especially if you're an ex-kid, 
the trial of Magneto played out the way it did in Uncanny X-Men 200, which will be in Uncanny X-Men Omnibus Volume 5. If you've not read it, I will stop talking about it. But this kind of foreshadows the things going on there. So here we have the good guys. They're all together and all the villains are together. So this is a really strange thing because you have X-Men bad guys, you have Spider-Man bad guys, you have Thor's villains in here. So, I mean, it's it's definitely a different array of characters that show up. Not everyone. You have Kang, the absorbing man right there. You have the wrecking crew. So you have Bulldozer and Piledriver and Thunderball. Uh, the Enchantress, the Lizard, Ultron, Dr. Octopus, Dr. Doom, Kang, the Conqueror right there, and, of course, Galactus. So how did everything come to be? Well, everyone is lost just as well as the reader. They don't know what exactly is happening. And then they look outside. They know they're, like, in some kind of outer space gathering. They don't know exactly where they are. All they know is they stepped into a building and poof. Or they were grabbed out of their reality and poof, here they are. And what they witness is an entire galaxy getting destroyed. So now they know they're not really dealing with anything normal. They're dealing with some kind of cosmic beings, which they have in the Contest of Champions with the whole, well, contest between two godlike beings. But here they're meeting something that they've never dealt with before. So Ultron loses it and he just goes on a rampage attacking the villains because this is what villains do. He goes after Galactus, and during this time, I think Ultron has his adamantium body. So Galactus just wipes the floor with him, just destroys Ultron. So all the villains, including Molecule Man, Owen Reese right here, who plays an important part in all this. I'm not going to go into detail about that, but I do need to talk a little bit about that character. They're all shocked, like, what the heck is this? And then a light opens up in the sky. And this is all you hear. I am from beyond. Slay your enemies, and all you desire shall be yours. Nothing you dream of is impossible for me to accomplish. And that's it. That's all they hear. And that's all you will hear from, well, what Galactus calls the Beyonder for a while. Now, so it's pretty much saying, kill your enemies, and I will grant all your wishes. Now, Galactus is not having it. This is a guy that destroys worlds. He eats planets, for Christ's sakes. So... What he does is fly up there, and he wants to confront him. And of course, Doctor Doom is always about having power. So he follows Galactus, and dude, Galactus just gets smacked. He just gets thrown like he's nothing. So now they're like, okay, maybe this is a lot more than just cosmic beings. Everybody's shocked. Nobody knows exactly what's going on. People turn on each other. Alliances are trying to be made, but... Like, Magneto's trying to hang with the good guys at first, and the villains won't take him, so he's like, you know what? I'm just gonna claim independence. I'm gonna be non-neutral. I'm out. Deuces. Dr. Doom is like, what in the world could have knocked out Galactus? I gotta get the villains, we're gonna get together, and we're gonna kill this Beyonder and take his power. But the villains are like, why would we do that, man? Didn't you hear that voice? If we kill the good guys, we could get whatever we want. And Dr. Doom being about all power, was like, you fools, if we kill the Beyonder, we can do whatever we want, anytime we want. So you got to respect a guy like that. So he goes off on his own. The, the X-Men and the Avengers are at each other's throats. They don't know who to trust. And then they are attacked. And that is the premise of Secret Wars. It's kind of a, a who-do-you-trust scenario because... As the issues progress, like, there are alliances that are made, there are betrayals, and, you know, everybody's looking for a leader, and of course, it makes sense that everybody chooses Captain America, but at first, Captain America doesn't want the role of leader, so they establish their own base of operations. Uh, Professor Xavier, during this time, by the way, can walk, and that is all explained during the latest, or the last Brood Saga, right before or the From the Ashes storyline. That can be found in Uncanny X-Men Omnibus Volume 4, if you're wanting to read that story. Like I said, I'm not going to go into detail, but I didn't need to explain why he's walking around. So, it's really cool, too, because this is, like, characters that don't really interact with each other outside of the, hey, uh, bad guys are attacking. We need to team up. Good job, Reed. Good job. Scott Summers, but here, you know, Cyclops is talking to Reed about his life. He just was recently in his honeymoon, and he got pulled into this. 
Now you can find out who you got married to uh, in the pages of Uncanny X-Men. Uh, but that's a whole nother story. But it's really cool to see them just sit down and have a conversation like that while still being attacked. But that is the wonder of Jim Shooter. I mean, he was able to do that. He was able to put these big event moments and then have some quiet scenes for character development. Now, there are two very important characters that are introduced in the pages of Secret Wars number three. And that is over here. Because... Doctor Doom, of course, wants an alliance with people. He wants Magneto. He's kind of laying it on thick to Owen Reese because he knows the ability of Molecule Man. Molecule Man really isn't about controlling molecules, but more about controlling the atomic and subatomic structure of things to just create things out of thin air if he wants to. That's how powerful of a character he is. And Doctor Doom knows that, and he wants to use that. But... Since Doctor Doom isn't allying himself with anybody, he finds these two random ladies here. Now, I say random because when I was reading this for the first time many years ago, I thought these characters were introduced in pages of She-Hulk or Spider-Woman. No, they just showed up here because I guess we needed more toys? Girl toys? I don't know. But this is the first appearance of Volcana, and that is Marsha Rosenberg. And this lady right here, who you probably don't recognize at first, uh, but she is about to become a very important character. And her name is Mary McFerrin. And now you probably recognize her as Titania. So now he's allying himself with those. And he sees a connection between Volcana and Molecule Man, so of course he's going to use that. Um, it, it's like all these characters are having to deal not just with their villains, but also the complexity of their relationship to these villains. And that was one of the best things about this. And there is an amazing scene here for anybody that has ever questioned Spider-Man. When Spider-Man sees that Magneto is trying to get the X-Men on his team, you know, Professor X is like, okay, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to join Magneto's side for now. Now, I love this because Storm at this time is the leader of the X-Men. But Professor X, just coming back fresh from space, is like... Nah, Storm, I, I know I respect that and you're leading them and all, but I think I need to be in charge here because the stakes are high. And she's like, Professor X. But anyway, Spider-Man eavesdrops on their conversation and, you know, they're about fighting him. But because of his spider sense and how much longer he's been at it, other than Wolverine, he's able to take down the X-Men by himself. As an X-Men reader, as a kid, I hated this. I was like... Bull crap! There's no way in hell he could take on all the X-Men. Rogue by herself could have depowered him. Wolverine would have sliced him up. But the older you get, the more you realize, holy crap, he is a very capable character. And one time could probably lead the Marvel Universe if, you know, if Captain America ever steps down. He is that great of a character. And it's moments like that that I love about this crossover. You have Magneto and Janet's weird moment there. Hulk... Showing how strong he is during this run. I mean, we've seen Hulk do some amazing things. Incredible, rather. But, like, holding up an entire mountaintop from keeping it from crushing people. Just, what? We are dealing with a whole new, different level of strength there. Now, uh, this is our Bob Layton issues right here. We meet Sa Saji. Yeah, I think that's her name. Saji. Who at first is crushing on Johnny Storm, because who didn't at the time? But then later on, something happens that she develops feelings for Colossus. Or be that Florence Nightingale thing. But, <laughs> I love this scene where Colossus is daydreaming about Kitty Pride. He's laying in bed with his shirt off and he's like, Oh man, I'm going to miss Kitty Pride. You know, we just started a relationship and uh, he, like, he's having these weird thoughts. And the professor is like, Hey, Colossus, you need to get over here right now. And... Colossus is like, oh man, uh, okay. <laughs> it's like your parents, at nah, never mind, I'm not even gonna go there. Uh, alright, so there are a couple of other things that happen that are very important here. We have the resurrection of Claw, and that's not a big deal. Ulysses Claw, uh, it's very important later on because it plays a role into the story of Galactus, and again, Doctor Doom, but it explains where he's been. He was absorbed by Dazzler because, remember, she absorbs sound to get light out. And she was able to destroy him. But he comes back and he's been like a part of Galactus's ship. All part, again, of Doctor Doom's plan. Doctor Doom's an awesome character in this. 
So I'm only going to talk about two more things, and that's it, because I don't want to go any more into big spoilers. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave the ending alone. So this is the other issue I wanted to talk about. Uh, there's a shadow that appears in issue number six at the end, and then it is revealed that, hey, we have a new Spider-Woman. This is Julia Carpenter. And she explains, hey, I'm also from Denver, and we have superheroes there. I'm Spider-Woman. I have strength, and these are my other abilities. And the Avengers are like, oh, okay, we can use some more help. You want to come and uh, hang out with us? And that's it. As a kid, like I said, I thought some of these characters were introduced somewhere else. And I was missing out on their first appearances. But this is where it took place. And the other issue is issue number eight. Because I feel like that's the issue that most people wanted to see when they think about Secret Wars. And that is not really the first appearance of the costume. Because like I said, issue of Amazing Spider-Man 252 which came months before this, was really the first appearance of the black costume. But this is the first appearance of the black costume within the story, how it happened. So, I guess to some people this is the first appearance of Venom or the alien symbiote. To me, it's just the first appearance of the black costume, because the whole story about Venom and the symbiote, all that, that didn't happen until much later. Or at least the, the alien costume did. But the whole Venom idea didn't happen until much later. So pretty much, Spider-Man's costume is all wrecked. And he is, again, walking around these alien buildings. And he finds this little black ball. And the black ball becomes attached to him. Voila! Spider costume. Brand new. Looking really cool. Uh, the other thing I didn't... So much to talk about in this series. The other thing I didn't talk about that I wanted to talk about is Ben Grimm. How he's able to now become a human here. Because that comes into play later on. And of course comes into play in the pages of Fantastic Four. And The Thing. But I guess I talked about it with my Thing overview. But I get that that's all I wanted to talk about. Besides showing some of the spread pages towards the end. Again, Mike Zack and John Beatty killing it on this. It's just a bunch of heroes fighting aliens. And then what else is collected in here? So you get the Thor issue right here. This is the Tom DeFalco issue. Ron Friends drawing this. And this is, again, a confrontation between Thor and Enchantress and what happened during the Secret Wars issues. And I'm so glad they included this. Because remember when I said that these characters of Titania Volcana just appear and they seem just, like, shoehorned in for not really MacGuffins, but to move the character of Owen and Crusher Creel, uh... The absorbing man around well that's what it really felt like but here it's explained exactly how it happened and this didn't happen until years later this is dan slot's run of she hulk and it explains how these two normal ladies from denver were part of secret wars how they even got there so i'm glad that that's in here for people that are completists about reading everything and understanding everything and not just having two characters randomly appear i'm surprised that they didn't include the Spider-Woman issue one, the Julia Carpenter issue, because that explains her origin story, as Valerie Cooper in there. Then we have the what-if issues, what if the alien costume had possessed Spider-Man, again, way after Venom was uh, written, this one's drawn by Mark Bagley, and then you have the what-if Secret Wars, and these are just, I think these are just an anthology series of what if it had a different type of ending. All the way in the back, you have the toys, which is, of course, the reason we have the series to begin with. I used to have a couple. I had Spider-Man. Of course, I had Wolverine. Doctor Doom actually looking like... Okay, I, I have to show my favorite... One of my top ten favorite uh, covers of all time. Oh my gosh, I love that cover. The details on that cover. Now, of course, that's not John Beatty inking it. That's Terry Onsen inking Mike Zek's pencils. Top 10 favorite covers of all time. I love that cover. Oh, man. Maybe I ought to do a video on my favorite covers of all time. That would be fun. Ooh. I'm turning 45 this year. I could do a top 45. Hey. Write that down. Somebody. All right. Yes, this is... Oh, look at that power and just refusing to be beaten down. And that is really who Dr. Doom is. And yeah, because he didn't have a cape in the toy. And that's here. Magneto also did not have a cape. And then you had some European versions. I've never even seen those. The pencils by Mike Zek. The inks by, I believe, John Beatty inked the cover to that. And then, of course, the finished cover. This is from Marvel Age, which we are going to get an omnibus of. The designs of the 
alien costume Spider-Man, the original pencils right there. You know, it's weird because I've gone on a lot about this omnibus. I guess that says something about how much it meant to me. Didn't realize until now how important this story was or how much I've really liked it. Even though it started off as a gimmick, hey, let's sell some toys. But then again, some of my favorite things started like that. <laughs> Looking at you, Transformers. Promise the reading order is coming back in February. Here are some original trade paperback covers. Here's one by Salvador La Roca. I think that's the one that I had when this one fell apart. I had this one. And then the Omnibus variant cover, in case you have the standard edition cover, which I don't know why I'm pointing at. All right, let's look at this binding. 496 pages, not much of an eye there. This one printed at the iMac printer. So something some people may have already noticed is that there is some art bleeding through, and that's because of the paper stock. Now, the paper stock isn't thin, thin. I'm not talking like JMS Spider-Man. It's actually pretty thick, but still there is some art coming through in the white pages. You can really tell when it's... Let me see if I can find a prime example. Okay, right here. You can see the whites around here, but then you can tell some of the art from the opposite side is coming through. I don't know why I didn't use that. Oh, because it doesn't have that many word bubbles or frames. Okay, let's do a comparison really quick to the original printing. All right, just in case, again, original printing, new printing here. So we're just going to open it up just to see a couple of differences. Of course, this using that marble look. Like I said, because they were going for that Masterworks look. This just has white pages and... I have to hold that down. Looks very similar with the exception of the different font they're using. And here's that page. Now, this first printing, I believe, is from 2008, if I'm not mistaken. It's, it's one of the oldest ones that I remember getting. And I waited for it because it was 100 bucks, And I was like, oh, man. Woo, I had to wait for a sell. I think I, I waited until it almost went out of print. And I do remember I ended up getting it at Tales of Wonder. I think back in 2010, 2011. Here we have the introduction. Pages looking a little darker here. But I wanted to look at the colors really quick. Sometimes the iMac colors are a little bit darker. Um, and... Yeah, actually, they are just a little bit. You can't really tell. Wanted to do a quick comparison with the pages, though. Let's see. All right, so here we have the books and the way they lay over. Uh, the original printing up there. A little more of a gutter curve, so you have just a little more art that's lost. But the colors are a little vibrant. A little more vibrant up there in that printing than this one. Also, you can see some of that art coming from the other side. And the colors are going to look a little bit different because they're also using different paper stock, too. Some paper absorbs colors better and makes colors pop out better. All right, let's look in the towards the middle of the book here. Again, not much difference other than colors looking just a little bit more vibrant up there. And that's the last page I want to compare it to. So it's the little slight difference in the colors, but that's about it. Um, that... As they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing this book, don't forget to check out our sponsor, CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and build of this omnibus, as well as the comparison to the original printing. Let me know in the comments down below if you are picking this up, if you've read it before, what you thought of the story, if you read them in single issues, if you have the trade, if you missed out on the original omnibus, and then, of course, which cover you're going to get. If you have any questions, leave your questions down below. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that bell for notifications. 
All that helps with our YouTube algorithm and our channel keep growing. Check out our Patreon. We have different tiers that meet your needs. And everyone, stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.